I think we all have those little cliches we love, no matter how played out they are. It could be a god power climax like the one presented in Half-Life 2, the high school settings of games like Persona 3 and 4, or rebels fighting against insurmountable powers that be like we see in Final Fantasy 7. For me though, personally, I am a massive sucker for the rival. The character who hounds you for the whole game, treats you as beneath them no matter how many times you crush them, but you can't help but have a bit of begrudging respect for, and it makes me giddy. It doesn't matter if they're a friendly rivalry like Sly Cooper and Carmelita Fox, an antagonistic rivalry like Solid Snake and Liquid Snake, or something a little more vague like the rivalry between Sora and Riku. I immediately get excited when I see one pop up for one simple reason. A properly crafted rival can not only help move the narrative forward, but put more pressure on you to get better at the game by giving you a coming storm to prepare for. The first thing I want to make clear is the difference between a rival and an antagonist, because the two are not inherently one and the same. A perfect example of this would be Dr. Wily and Proto Man in the Mega Man games. Dr. Wily is undeniably the core antagonist, however Proto Man stands as the rival. The reason for this is simple, Proto Man is Mega Man's foil, a mirror to who he is, what he's capable of, and how he behaves. Dr. Wily has little to nothing in common as a character to Mega Man. He's just an old human man with no strength without his machines. Meanwhile, it's very easy to see Proto Man as an alternate reality version of Mega Man where he refused to trust Dr. Light. And by looking at this, we come to like Mega Man more as a character by contrasting both his personality and his combat abilities with that of someone who is incredibly similar, but completely different. We might not look as cool as Proto Man, we might not hit as hard as Proto Man, and we might not have his cool ass shield, but we can absorb the powers of Robot Masters, look pretty cool in our own right, and we're doing the right thing. All of this, however, begs the question of how do we craft a suitable foil? There are admittedly a number of ways to do this, but the most popular in gaming, and for that matter, animation at large, is a trope known as Red Oni, Blue Oni. Even if you don't know the trope, I promise you that you actually know the trope. If you love games, it's X and Zero. If you love anime, it's Rey and Asuka. And if you have a Tumblr, it's Ruby and Sapphire. In this trope, a Red Oni is someone who is aggressive, extroverted, and runs mainly off emotion and gut reaction. A Blue Oni is someone who's calm, collected, introverted, and runs mainly off intellect. I know by describing this, it has probably brought a million different characters into your head. Ryu and Ken, Squall and Cypher, Sonic and Knuckles, Kay Catherine and Sea Catherine, Crystal Maiden and Lena, and so on. And I will say, this trope isn't inherently antagonistic. For instance, Jack and Clank would qualify as the Blue Oni to Daxter and Ratchet's Red Oni, respectively. However, what makes this trope so strong is the drastic contrast between personalities. Things immediately seem more intense when paired up with their exact opposites. White seems stronger paired against black, heavy music seems heavier compared to soft, and personality seems stronger when they are contrasted against opposites. As such, bringing in a rival that can serve as a Red Oni or a Blue Oni to the player character can make them shine. This is the founding principle of the foil, and Red Oni Blue Oni does that so well and so quickly that it's almost ubiquitous amongst video game rivals. Finally, in order to demonstrate why all of this works, we need to look at the structure of how, what I consider to be, the two best rivals in gaming are presented. Virgil from Devil May Cry 3, and Blue from the first gen Pokemon games. And the reason I'm comparing them is the way they are structured is almost identical. Both Virgil and Blue begin at identical starting points as the player, with Virgil and Dante being brothers, while Red and Blue come from the same hometown and get their Pokemon at the same time. From there, we are introduced to our own player character, and more importantly, their limitations. You are shown just how powerful your rival is, with Virgil killing the Hell Vanguard in one swing and Blue having already beaten Brock by the time you've even showed up. This sets up one undeniable fact in your mind. They are better than you. As you progress through the game, you continue to see the impact and consequences their actions have on the world and all of the ways in which they outclass you. You routinely have to fight them again and again, more than likely losing to them at least once or twice. Then finally, at the climax, you fight someone who very well could have been the final boss. So much so that in both cases they become the final boss of the sequel, with Lance becoming the Johto League Champion and Old Man Hate Shield stealing the power of the Blade of Sparta. 
However, your victory is snatched away from you at the last possible moment, and you proceed to fight your rival one last time, one-on-one, -on -one, with new, more powerful tools than you had ever seen before. Then, and only then, after your grueling journey, do you finally, officially beat them. The beats of this narrative structure build on each other, one step at a time, to craft a character in your mind who is both monolithically powerful and completely beatable with the skills you've acquired over your journey. Failure to beat them simply means that you haven't learned the game as well as you should, and because they have almost the exact same strengths as you, losing to them almost feels insulting, as though they beat you at your own game. This grants you an emotional justification for getting better at the game. You might not want to take the time to figure out the proper iframe timing for your dodges, or level up your Pokémon and find good TMs, but if you want to keep up with your rivals, you're going to have to. Back when I was 10, I remember playing Pokémon in my parents' living room while no one was home. I'd finally beat Lance after a couple failed attempts and I was elated. Then the moment came, for Lance to crown me champion. Or I would have been if Blue hadn't beaten me to the punch. I charged into the next room, furious about my stolen crown, and immediately got slammed. But I refused to be beaten by him, so I immediately ran back to Victory Road, proceeded to grind my Venusaur up to 55 just so I'd have a chance. That's right, I'm a Bulbasaur guy. And that moment where all of my work paid off and I crushed him? I wouldn't trade that feeling for anything in the world. Hey everyone, Ryan here. I just want to take a quick moment and thank you all for watching, and I especially want to give a quick shout out to the people who have been taking time out of their day to spread my videos around. I've been seeing my videos get posted a couple places here and there, and I cannot tell you guys how much that means to me. Every time I see it, it just straight up makes my day. I always hoped, but never thought, that someone would deem the stuff I'm saying here to be interesting enough to push on to other people. <laughs> so, to all of you who have put in that bit of effort for my sake, Thank you very, very much. And to those of you who haven't shared my videos, it's cool. I love you all the same. In the future, I should probably script these out. Anyways, thanks again. You're all great. Peace.